Dr. Josh Gifted. And I want to thank him for running the whole way up from Myersville, Maryland, to uh, be here. Josh is a veterinarian with uh, Mid Maryland Vets, and he's the one that works on just about anything. And um, what, how we're going to do this tonight is we're going to be very informal. If you have a specific question about health, just ask Tim. Uh, Josh is a graduate of Virginia Tech University and uh, Penn State was playing in 2001. <laughs> uh, but uh, he is uh, part of about a, how many partner operations? Six partners, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to him right now. All right, thanks a lot, Brett. Is that better, or do you think the light's on? Pick on, pick down. Where's the picture on it? There you go. There you go. All right, I think Rick said it's very informal. If you have questions or comments, or let me know. Have a discussion. Um, I basically uh, asked me to talk about how problems keep the goats. I kind of broke it down into two areas. The first major part would be about parasites, which Good owners, you know, it's a big problem. And then I kind of have a handful of other problems that I see commonly out there practices as well towards the end. All right. Can everybody hear okay? All right. So the most common parasite that we deal with, the technical name for it is Amonchus contortus. And uh, it is a blood sucking parasite, okay? And yeah, the nickname for it is the barbed pole worm. Because when you look at it under the microscope, it actually looks like a barbed bar pole. Okay? And uh, it's very, you know, it's a very pathogenic uh, parasite and it produces a lot of eggs. And that's why it causes such a big problem with the amount of eggs that this worm sheds uh, once inside the sheep goat. And uh, the problem in this area is that. During, at least during the warmer months, we have a perfect climate for those worms to thrive. This Amonchus worm loves um, warm and wet environment. And so uh, what I've seen is that now, as boar goats become more and more popular around here, and I don't think they're really made to live in this climate. So I don't think they handle the worms as well. So I think the boar goats were more originated in drier, um, not as much moisture climates. So that has something to do with uh, why we see parasite problems in organs. Okay, so here is a uh, picture of the worm there. You can see there, it kind of has a red streak through it. Um, it just looks just like a barber pole. And uh, this here is the, uh, that's the um, stomach cut open, the abdomen. So these worms will live in the abomasum and they'll attach to the wall of the stomach and they'll just, they live their blood suckers. Yes. So generally, uh, somebody called it a sick goat during the summer. 90% of the time, this is what it is. Okay? Um, the major thing that it causes is anemia, um, which is a low blood cell count and mucous membranes will be pale. Generally, you want more pinker color. Okay. Uh, you'll get bottle jaw, which does everybody know what that is? It's that like kind of fluid developing underneath the, the uh, jaw. Uh, they'll lose weight, be in uh, poor body condition. Uh, they get to, you know, uh, further along with disease, they won't eat as well. They'll become lethargic, and uh, they can. If they get enough of these worms, they make it anemic enough, they can definitely kill them. Uh, the tricky thing is that. Uh, this type of worm uh, that we're talking about, the fungus, does not cause diarrhea. Okay, that's not, it can rarely, but most of the time, even though they may be loaded with this worm, their, their, their manure is not going to look any different, okay, than a normal one. Um, so that's since something you got to get over sometimes. You know, when I tell a farmer that it's got a severe worm infestation, they say, well, it's not possible to have diarrhea. But this worm, it's a major thing that it does suck blood as it's attached to the, the suck pole. So uh, the, um, the life cycle is very simple. Um, 
the uh, worms would be in the pasture, on the grass. Uh, that's, that's where they can survive, especially when it's warmer and wetter out. You know, if you have a more concrete lot or a dry lot, the worms can't replicate as well there, okay? Uh, so, they, so animals in that, in, in that type of uh, housing should have as bad as if you have a whole bunch on pasture. The worms could just replicate more there. And so the worms go inside the sheep of the goat, and then um, they lay eggs there, and then the eggs hatch the worms. Okay, so very important thing when we're talking about, you know, treating and controlling and managing, you know, this type of worm, Romanius, is that we want to be very selective when we do it, okay? We don't want to just go out and deworm everything, all right? Um, the major reason why we want to do that is that, um, as you guys probably know, that the dewormers for sheep, available sheep and goats are becoming very resistant. That just because you deworm your goat or your sheep doesn't mean that all the worms are going to go away. And sometimes it doesn't do anything. All right, and that's becoming more and more of a problem. So we're trying to train people to only deworm the animals that need to be that need to be dewormed, and the ones that are okay, just leave them alone. Okay. And so and by doing that, you'll be able to learn within your flock or your herd which ones naturally more resistant to parasites, which ones um, seem always need to be deworked. You can kind of use that to selectively pull in your herd or your flock. So you kind of you breed those animals to be the future. Okay? The uh, the major tool we use is something called the matcha. Has anybody heard of that? What do you guys want to say what the what the basis of that is? Come on, you raise your hand. Well, you're checking your membranes to see how pink they are. You want shade. Exactly. So, so, so basically, the flash system was made. So the major problem is anemia. So you look at the membranes around the eyes to see if they're like pink, are they white, and are they in between. And depending on what they are, is what is determines if you deworm that animal or not. Okay. But the ones that always are a nice pink color. You know, they're not being severely affected, uh, infected, so let's not keep throwing dewormer in there. And that, if you throw dewormer into an animal that doesn't need it, you're just exposing those worms to it, and they're getting more and more resistant. And down the road, that dewormer will not work as well on your farm. Um, so, I'll show you a few more pictures here, kind of go over more in depth with the Malachia system. Um, I don't know exactly what it stands for. I think it's got to do with some guy's name. It was developed in South Africa uh, for this very reason. Um, it helps to help drug, drug resistant uh, parasites over there. Um, you assess the anemia, anemia like we talked about um, and determine which anim, individual animals need to be dewormed. So we're not just going out and saying, hey, today we're going to deworm our 50 goats. We can go through, check them all on a, on a regular basis and only do the ones that are the numbers more pale. Okay? So here it is right here. If you get your Formacha card, um, which I think you probably gotta take a class to get, it's probably not that hard. Um, this is a card right here. A lot of producers would actually carry that card around. They pull down that the lower eyelid and look right there, the capillary then see um, what color it is. And you match it up, match it up here. Yeah, turn that. I want to turn that one. There. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's better. That's Can you see it better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So over here would be more pale, and here would be you know uh, normal high red blood cell count. Okay. That's basically what this color is showing is high how how high your red blood cell count. That's what this P PCD test is. Uh, so basically, the scale one to five, where one is more red, you know, as it goes to two and three, it's more pink, and five is white. Okay. Uh, so most of the time, you recommend deworm when you're at the one and two, which you see a little deworming gun there. Um, oh no, I mean four and five, 
And then one and two, you usually leave alone, but they're, they're okay. Three is kind of debatable. You kind of got to use your best judgment, look at the animal as a whole. Uh, is she in good condition? Does she have bottle jaw? Is there anything else going on with her? Um, and also, you got to think about which, you know, is she at high risk? You know, younger stock may be a little more risk. One that's getting ready to ban or kid may be at more high risk. Um, so you got to take all those factors in. Okay. Here's just a few tips on how to use the matcha. Um, you kind of got to check them in, in regular intervals. And it, and it really depends on the time of year, right? Um, like we said, these worms are more of a problem in you know, the warm season when it's wetter out. So that time of year, depending on your herd or flock, you may have to check them every two to three weeks. Go through them, check your eye colors, you want the ones that are needed. And as you do that, you know, you kind of get used to about how much time you can let go before you, 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 you check the herd again. Okay? Uh, and how much problem you're having. And every time you're checking them, you're treating a good portion of your herd of flock. You should probably check them a little more often. Okay? Uh, try to have the same people do it so you're consistent when you're doing it. Uh, as far as giving the scores one through five. Um, and uh, that's basically it. Have you guys, have you two that heard of this? Have you guys tried that before? <coughs> we, we use uh, uh, sometimes on a uh, lamb or once they're healing, it takes a long time to get it going. And that's where it's tempting to be more of that right. before you come to that. Right. Showing this again, just kind of the difference there. Whereas this would probably be a severely anemic and have a high you know, in, in between maybe a, a two or so. Um, you know, it's hard. You know, it's hard when you're first doing it to, you know, you go out and deworm, you want to deworm everybody. It's hard to, you know, you have one next to it affected, and one's not. It's hard to get over the fact that you don't have to do that one. But really, in the long run, you're helping the future of your block your herd not to go resistance by using unnecessary uh, deworming medication. Whatever they're not anemic, is uh, there anything that we can give them to help bring back red blood cells like iron shots? I mean I've heard people talk about it. I don't I've heard both the ways that it helps and it can actually hurt as well. So I don't and there's nothing that really said for sure to it, okay? Um, there's not a lot else you can uh, I'll talk about treatment of wet dewormer and how to do it. Tips would have to be most effective a little later. Um, but those just kind of got to be a little more aggressive. Um, but this bad, I tend to use two different types of dewormers at the same time. So I kind of have a combination. Because um, it's kind of just three different classes of dewormers. Yeah. You know, they work in different ways. Yeah, right. But, you know, once they get to that point, if you don't get them turned around, Right. We raise pigs. They're, They're going to die. die. So we need something. Nice. We're looking for something to help get red blood cells back in. So that's why I'm asking on the iron question. Yeah. Is there anything that we can start to administer along with you know your your farmers to start helping that good bring back good red blood cells? Right. Because you're 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 fixing one problem. You're killing the parasite. So as soon as you kill that parasite, that parasite dies, now you have a bunch of holes in your gate and it's still leaving blood. Right? So what we need is something to help bring the red blood cells back. Which, yes. So is there anything out there that can be done to bring the recovery back of the red blood cells? I'd say in like a normal, average environment on a farm, you know, there are heroic things you could do, yes. As far as you know. So yeah. you, we could get the iron shot. You could give an iron shot, you know, if you have a very expensive goat, you know, a hospital day to a blood treat to you. Well, I don't know. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are many. I mean, there are many. There are losses and loss. I mean, if you're, you know, yeah, if, you're, if you're losing, you know, it doesn't matter if it's an expensive one or not. I mean, you're not dealing with it. They don't get that if you take over time. They do not. You are like checking them regularly. You know, it's going to be, be a mess. Not, you know, iron's only some part of the red blood cell too, right? right. She's got to, you know, she's got to make those red blood cells again. So the iron's not going to like just 
pancreas stimulate to produce oh, the bone marrow. Yeah, I understand. To do yeah. all the work. So the iron is just one small part. Right. Is anything that we can apply to the pastures that is not part of the the, the, what can you apply to the pasture? I don't know if there's anything you can apply to it, but you can manage your pasture. You know, it's nice to not just have a whole lot of one pasture all the time. Um, the, so the worms tend to live closer to the ground. They don't climb all the way up the grass. So if you're able to get them, once they eat it down to a certain length, it's nice to be able to get them off that and let it regrow. The closer they get to the ground, more likely um, they are to, uh, to, to get the worms. Um, so there's things like that. Another thing is, you know, try not, like if you say you know, you're, you're, you're going to for macho and you're picking out ones that are, uh, that are you know, severely affected and deworm them. And some people move goats at the same time. Don't move these ones that are severely infected on a pasture that hadn't been used. Because that was just going to, all the worms in are just going to be contaminated that pasture. Um, it's things like that um, that, 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 can, that can help you. Okay? Because now I, would, I don't know of anything that can be put on there to help with it. There is a product just coming out of the bioworm. Fungus actually, you know, goes after the worm. It's just a something in the last couple weeks. Yeah. Towards the end, I'll have a slide, a list of other things to do, not deworming. You know, to help control. And that's that was the last one on my list. But when you deworm, you keep the worm that is inside the animal, or you are just flushing the worm. You're you're, you're, you're killing the worm. Okay. Yes. So she can't make any more eggs. That's. The worms make a lot of eggs, and that's how they reproduce so quickly. And you give the eggs to Some dewormers do, some don't, depending on the stage. There's a lot of, you have the egg, and you have larval um, stages. A lot of them kill a lot of the stages. Um, so that's why you can't, you can't just go one time and say, I checked it one time this year, and I'm going to do that. And I dewormed them, and she'll be clean. Um, another thing is that there's some of these, um, they can actually worms during times of the year where it's not, you know, where they can't replicate a lot outside the animal. They will have to become arrested in the stomach of the sheep or goat and just hide out there for a lot. And a lot of times, dewormers can't get those as well. So that is like an aggressive development type larval stage. So even though sometimes you think you got it all under control. That the rest of the stage wakes up, matures, and starts making eggs again, and kind of starts to cycle all over again. And there is no select preventative. There is no select preventative. Um, no, there is. I'll talk about some, some stuff a little later, okay? <coughs> this right here is just um, kind of. It kind of makes the decision made about how we talked about score number three, where it's kind of in between do you do it or not. It kind of just says, you know, which ones are you, which ones are you more likely to treat, which ones maybe you don't have to treat. Uh, like you know, the first one up there says goats. They say a lot of times they deworm them. And they seem to have a little more problems with worms than sheep do. Um, kids and lambs, you'd rather do. You know, if you had mature animals, to have the three, maybe let them go at the time. Um, there's just a whole whole list of things here that can help you determine uh, the, the, the score of threes. Where you actually treat them or not. A lot of times, it's kind of you're knowing your herd, using your best judgment, and looking at the animal as a whole, whether you do it or not. Uh, like I said, there's a. They kind of have this system here to help you look at the, uh, the animal as a whole, not just look at the eyes, um, eye color, you know, look for the bottle jaw, look at their, their hair coats, uh, do they have any diarrhea? Another thing important to look at. Their body condition, you know, how much fat covering they have, you know, when you, 
you know, sometimes, certain times of year, it's hard, some sheep, it's hard to tell if they're losing weight or not when they have, you know, a bunch of wool. Um, so you really got to put your hand on and feel them because they could be getting thin under um, that wool without you being able to tell by just your eyes. Um, so use your body condition as, you know, um, whether you should deworm those um, questionable ones is another tool. All right, so we already touched on resistance a little bit, but it's definitely a problem. Um, it, it's probably, you know, everywhere, and it's going to happen. Um, like I said, there's no really dewormer that kills all the worms. Um, and all the dewormers are out there. Worms have resistance to, to all of them at some point. And it varies within, you know, your herd, to your flock, your herd, it all kind of varies. And within the herds as well. Um, there's individuals, you know, within a flock or a herd that are more resistant um, to parasites than others. Um, it kind of kind of varies that way. Um, so, as far as resistant location is a big deal because there's certain areas um, in the country, like we talked about, that have those climates that are more have heavy work burdens, and between individual herds and flocks. And So resistance um, can actually, you know, it's passed on to those worms' offspring. So it's just, just getting the worst as time goes on. Um, so we can't get rid of resistance completely, but we'll talk about some things that can uh, help uh, prevent uh, resistance from uh, keeping, uh, getting more slowed down the rate of it. Um, and one thing you can just think about is when you're bringing new animals into your herd or flock and you buy some in, some people would say it's a good idea to, you know, deworm them and treat them uh, since you don't really have a history with them before you put them out, out in your, with, with your main group. It's, uh, it's hard to know exactly how much worm burden they're carrying. Um, they may have ones that, you know, worms are outside um, that your animals aren't used to dealing with. <coughs> All right, so the big thing to slow down the resistance is to deworm properly, not to underdose. You don't want to give what we call sub-therapeutic sub -therapeutic levels of dewormer. When you deworm, you want, you want to get the best chance to kill that worm, okay? So you got to use things like make sure you use a dosing syringe when you're dosing. Make sure you use the right amount. You know, weigh your animals every once in a while. Get a weight tape or something so you know how much you should be given. Um, and... The other thing is uh, try to use, always use oral dewormers. Do most of you guys at deworm use oral? Yeah. That, that, that's the way to go. Uh, you know, you're going right, and worms are in the stomach, you want it to be right on in there. You know, using injectables and forearms are more likely to get uh, resistant. Um, and just try to always use the right dose. Any questions? So I'll just touch on something here about a way you could, you know, if you wanted to know how you were doing in your herd, ways to test for uh, resistance uh, within your herd or flock. There's two ways. Um, has anybody done fecal samples to do egg counts? What did they come back at? Well, I, I did it myself. Oh, you did it yourself?
believe it's only done in Georgia, by the University of Georgia. And if you send um, your samples there, it'll actually have a test that will tell you, it'll test all the good murmurs out there, and it'll tell you which ones um, in your flock are most likely to work, which, which dewormers uh, have resistance and which ones are susceptible. Um, and uh, those are kind of two ways to tell um, what kind of resistance you got in your bird flock. So this last one we're going to have down here, I don't know, anybody ever heard this term, refugia? It's kind of a made up word, I think, <laughs> by the parasitologists. And, uh, Basically, you want to have some refugia out there. You want to have some, some worms and some parasites that you're not exposing to dewormers. Okay? The more you have out there like that, um, those are those aren't going to keep on getting more, more resistant. Um, so that way, like, like you're talking about, don't deworm everyone. Don't use a camacho, only deworm the ones that need it. Um, you know, don't immediately deworm and move animals to a clean pasture. Um, you know, if, you, if you're in an area where you have, you know, you don't have a heavy stocking density out in your pasture, you may not have to deworm as often, you know, um, and after you treat them, deworm them, you can leave them in a, you know, in a dry lot or something for 24 to 48 hours, and then, and then move them. Um, and this is all ways to kind of keep, um, you know, keep the, the level of deworming you're using in your herd down some. And keep ones unexposed ones out there, so those worms will reproduce, and those, their offspring will have less resistance to dewormer because dewormer resistance is just getting worse. Okay, does everyone understand that? Go ahead. And just to note so that everybody is aware, if you haven't seen the poster yet, uh, we're going to be offering a free fecal testing, so that'll be coming up, I believe, in May through ADM. And so if anybody's interested, um, we have a procedure on what you need to do if you want to bring any people sample. All right, now we'll talk a little about dewormers. These are just some of the ones that are out there. Um, like we said, you want to always use oral dewormers. You want to stay away from injectables and morons. Um, like I said before, there's three classes of dewormers. Uh, probably everybody's heard of safeguard, right? Um, that's kind of that validation is one class we call them you know the white paste dewormers. Um, next one people heard of probably ivermectins, right? Ivermectin and cydectin are kind of one class, and then the other class, um, the middle one there is probably the most common one would be lamasol or prohibit. So there's kind of three classes, and they all kind of have they all kind of act differently to kill the worms, and they all kind of get their own different types of you, know, you, get, you can have resistance to one type, one class of these dewormers in your herd or flock, but another class may work. Understand what I'm saying? And that, that's what that one drench right test does that they send down to the Georgia. They'll tell you which classes are more likely to work on your animals. All right, just a few things you kind of talked about already. Um, always use oral dewormers. Um, Goats, like I said before, they seem to have more of a problem and usually always require more than, than sheep. So a lot of, most time in the goats you get, depending on the product, most problems um, you get, get double dose. Um, make sure you use a dose of syringe and use it correctly. Um, you know, get, make sure you know you have to get a large amount, take your time giving it, make sure it swallows all of it. Um, you know, know what how big your animals are, how much they weigh, so you're given the right amount. Um, like I said before about combination dewormers, especially in severe cases, I like to use two different kinds. Um, that way, one doesn't work, the other one will. Um, Question, Doc. Yeah, go ahead. Would you use two different wormers to use them at the same time? Or Absolutely, use them at the same time. Don't mix them in the same syringe. Yeah. I would definitely use them at the same time as the you know, correct dose. Right. Right. Get half dose of each one. Use a full dose of two different kinds. And we like to do them, like I had this class up there, one from each class. So, you know, if you have a little bit more resistance to one class than the other, right. you know, you're more likely to have one I don't, I don't do combinations just generally when I'm going through checking them. Right. But if I feel like I have one that's pretty effective, it's going downhill, I kind of like doing that. They call me, they call me out there to look at one and I say it's got bad paras parasites, I'm usually going to 
recommend they do too. <clears throat> I do all of our people samples there at the farm. Uh huh. And the only thing you were talking about the egg count. The only thing I do is I take the slide, uh -huh. which I have a one by one cover slip on the right. slide, right. and I and I go through that entire uh, cover slip and I count. You count all the eggs. Yes. So as long, yeah, that's accurate. As long as each time you use a, you use a similar amount of feces. Yes. To do yes. the sample, then then you would be. As long as you just in that way. Understand yeah. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. As long as you do that. That should work. Yeah, we have the regular samples, things that we take right. the same amount every time. Right. Yeah. What, what has your experience been? Well, I started out doing whitetails because we had 54 deer on the farm. And, and uh, so, you know, we, we actually noticed that our uh, Nigerians was more acceptable to the anemic than. No, I'm sorry. The Nubians, the Nubians was more acceptable to um, the barber pole rum than the, uh, the Nigerians. Uh, we had two Nubians and they were very bad. And uh, we have had hardly any trouble with the Nigerians as far as that goes. Yeah, and they definitely see out that there's definitely, you know, a genetic component That's what to resistance. And they, I think they say it's, you know, as far as heritability, it's about a modern about a moderate level about how well it passes on to their altar. But it does seem like different breeds, you know, do respond better. Yeah. So here, here's a few other things, uh, you know, besides dewormers, we touched on a lot of them. Um, like the bottom, the bottom one there is what, what he was talking about, nematode trapping fungus. What did you, you say the name of the product was? Bioworm. Bioworm. That, that, that's one thing to look at. There's been some studies out there um, that uses copper wire particles. I don't know how they figured this out, but actually it's like a bolus that they give them, and um, it seems to have a deworming effect. Um, Excuse me, isn't it copper, copper back to sheep? Copper can be toxic to sheep, yes. So if I put that in there, then they eat that. Yes, yes, they did do that, and they did it on sheep too, and uh, I and I think they made it, <laughs> but I, I don't have I, I don't really have anybody that does it. I just kind of I read about it whenever I get some literature. A lot of times it's in there, but I when I had sheep, I don't think I get that to copper. Sheep died. So yeah, he's right. Well, copper is definitely toxic to sheep. Maybe, maybe that's why it feels warm too. I don't know. Um, so there are. You could. I wish I had one. If I had paper, I had. I'd give it to you so you could read it. But it, the stuff I read doesn't seem like it's that drastic of an improvement. But it just seemed. I guess they, they were looking for something that bigger herds of flocks could do, so they didn't have to use so much deworm. This is one of the things they found. Genetic selection, we kind of talked about that. He saw, you know, within the breed difference and genetics within your herd too, within the same breed, some would be more resistant than others. Uh, we talked some about pasture and grazing management, about, you know, when to move them, uh, try not to contaminate the pasture too much, um, try not to get the, let the pasture get too short, because that's where the worms are, and as they eat down that, the uh, short grass, that's when they become best of the most. Um, Rick probably talk about nutrition, but there's studies out there that say that herds and flocks are um, fed very well, you know, always you know, have good condition, a balanced diet, seem like they are less affected by parasites. Ones, you know, that kind of skip on the feeding may not feed them as much as, you know, someone may recommend. It seem like those ones have more of a problem with parasites. And then the other thing is around kidding and um, lambing, that there's something that there's egg rise around that time, right before they're going to kill lambs. Has anybody ever heard about that? Spring rise. Yes. And so those those are the ones you kind of want to make sure you check them. There's some people out there would say you deworm all your 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 does you use you know a couple weeks before they before they're due, uh, and at least check the place for color because that's when 
egg, there would be an egg rise, and they're just more highly susceptible, okay? Kind of had host immunity up there first, I just kind of talk about that there's different, you have different types of animals within your herd flock. You know, you have the pregnant ones, the ones that are, uh, you know, the ones that are adults that are pregnant, you know, earlier, halfway through, they're not as susceptible as the ones getting ready to, you know, have the babies. Um, now, then you have, you know, your lambs and kids, they just weaned, they're going to be more susceptible because they haven't developed a natural, natural immunity yet. So you've got to know um, which animals on your farm are more likely to get parasites, you know, pay, pay more attention to them. Now, by doing all these things, you know, you can try and use less dewormer on your farm, do some of these things. As time goes on, I'm sure more of these will come out. Okay. We got a list of them. We're going to work on some other diseases now. All right, any, any questions about parasites? What's the best thing for, what's the best thing for a meningeal deer worm? Meningeal deer worm. Deer worm. Deer brain worm. When they have it, I generally do safeguard. And I do it, I do it once a day. I don't just do it once. Um, that's generally what I do. I take around the swelling in the brain of the spinal cord. Generally, um, yeah, I, I use safeguard. I have had people use ivermectin before and I've had mixed results. Um, and when, I, when I use safeguard, um, and just generally deworming too, sometimes I see like I have better, um, better success if I do the safeguard with white pastry dewormers two days in a row. Especially on this more affected animal, it seems like it helps. And another thing you can try doing is, you know, when you know you're going to go out and deworm them, maybe hold them off feed side. It seems like when they're not as full as feed, then the dewormer will have more contact with the worms and help them. Understand what I'm saying? Those are kind of two, two things that I look at. What's the, I don't want to call it, um, what's some of the identifications of that worm? Like, for the animal? Mental worm? Yeah. Well, it's, it's basically neurologic. The majority of the time I see it, um, it affects their hind end. There's, yes, they get, they're kind of weak in the hind end, kind of wobbly, they're not strong in their hind end. They lean. Yes, they, they kind of sway back and forth, they just don't have full control, and it basically progresses to full paralysis eventually. You know, it's, yeah, like you said, it's, it's in, the deer helps spread it around, and actually, it's, and it's spread. Snails as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, uh, and as it gets progresses, when that worm's literally just digging holes in the spinal cord, I see it go up the brain and then it causes seizures. So it could be just hind hind end weakness how it starts, and then you just neurological disease just progresses. All right, so I got called out here for this one here. Anybody have an idea what that looks like? Huh? What's green? It could be. It, it, it could look like that. If I took a beetle on the key, I went up. I went up to it and I tried to uh, bend its legs. I couldn't bend its legs. Tetanus. Tetanus. Anybody seen tetanus before? Anybody got anything over tetanus? Tetanus before? It's very hard. Very hard to get them over tetanus once I see them like this. Should be here four hours. You know, the nickname lockjaw. You know, the biggest thing with tetanus is that you know, they can't eat or drink, even if you're treating them. They can't eat and drink their time, they're just going to die. Um, and anybody, anybody out there know kind of when, you, when I see tetanus, um, you know, there's got to be a wound. What what management practices out there could cause tetanus? Yes. Disbloating. <laughs> huh? Disbloating. Disbloating is one thing. What, what, what is something else you would routinely do to castration? Castration, especially the, anytime I, the most common time I see is when somebody uses the bands. It's just the type of the wound that the bands cause. That's when most of the time I see tetanus is after that. Okay? Um, and also be tail docking. Um, so you need some wound, and the band is the most common. Um, anybody here vaccinate? 
Genus? Yeah. CDNT. That's CDNT is everybody should use CDNT on the vaccine program. If you don't, talk to vet about it. It's very cheap, easy to do, and definitely helps it protect against tetanus. Yes, that will be able to spread it on the kids. That's the only way to get the protection. Right. So the CD and T, tetanus stands for the T. C, D, and D, um, C, D, the C and D is a type of clostridium. Did somebody say clostridium before? What does it look like? So, uh, so the vaccine, C, D, and T, that we like using, protects against clostridium. C, D, and T is the other. There's most vaccine companies make it. You get it, get it uh, a lot of places. So, yeah, that was tetanus. They vaccinate for it. Once they get it, it's very hard to treat. I see it most commonly after banning. Anybody have any idea what that is? Sorry. What you said? Sorry. Well, aside from that, they call it stargazing. Oh, yeah. Polio. Polio. Yes. That's cool. Polio. And what, what, what other, what, what's the, have you seen polio before? What's the difference between polio and mysteriosity? I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Jump ahead. Uh, so polio, I most commonly see is when people, they, they just say something's off in the end. The majority of the first thing I notice is that they're blind. A lot of times they're just staring in the corner. Blind staggers. Yes, my father Yeah, they're yeah, just staring in the corner. Um, that's kind of early, that's the early part of the disease. And if it's not picked up on, it'll end up like this, just showing severe neurologic problems. Stargazing, seizures, coma. Basically, what happens is um, long term, the name of it is polioencephalomalacia, which basically means the great head of your brain is going to function. Okay? So that's pretty severe. And does anybody know what, what, causes, what causes that? Thiamine deficiency. deficiency, which is a B vitamin. And so it is definitely treatable if it's treated early on. When it gets to this stage, it's a little tougher. But if you get them when they're Seems like it's younger stocks more, more effective. If you catch it earlier on, that time injections will, will, will bring them around. Say, yes, yes. Anybody, any, any idea what the causes are? A couple, there's a whole yeah. list of them. Yeah, OBP. Yeah, a lot of times it's feed, you know, a lot of times it's feed related. Um, basically, thiamine is a B vitamin, and it's made in the rumen, and depending on how the animals fed, they can make these enzymes called thiaminases that just breaks down the thiamine. And the animal gets real low in it, and you start to see these neurological diseases. A lot of times I tend to see it in younger animals, and you know, animals start to get on more of a brain crash. Okay? One other thing that they say could, uh, could cause it is a high sulfur intake, or high sulfur in the water. It has been connected with with more, more polio. Uh, like I said, most common I think is see the blindness, you treat it with the thiamine, which thiamine is, you know, people have B vitamins, B complex, thiamine is B1, it's, it's in there. If you read the label, it's on there. Any questions about polio? All right. Who's back there? Listeriosis. Everybody knows what listeriosis is? Anybody know what the nickname for that disease is? Sure. Circling disease. So you can kind of show in different ways. A lot of times they kind of have a unilateral you know, presentation. They're kind of doing everything to one side. Or sometimes I just see them, they're just going in circles nonstop. What about right and normal left? Yeah, I mean, it can be either way. It can be either way. And, uh, so a lot of times before they circle, they just have a head tilt or a head turn, or they'll cause they'll cause something called facial paralysis, where its eyelid will droop, its ear will droop, its tongue will hang out. So basically, listeria, which is a bacteria, causes micro abscesses in the brain stem and affects the nerves, the cranial nerves that are, that are uh, you know, affecting uh, balance and eyes and ears and tongue. So it is, you might grab this is the brainstem, that's a pretty <coughs> serious thing. So depending on how early you pick it up, is if you can uh, get a moment or not. 
this has listeria bacterial, and it's, you know, it's abscess in the brain stem. We do treat it with antibiotics, and I, I'd say I'd have mixed results, kind of any antibiotic I've tried. Honestly, it seems like they can still eat and drink, and by the time the antibiotics work, a lot of times I get it to come around. But it's, if it's affecting their head so much that it's hard for me to eat, eat or drink, it seems like it, 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 it's tough. Um, Questions on listeriosis? Yeah, I would say we just got to go around with that. Uh -huh. It doesn't fit out too much. It's cheap or good? It's cheap. Do you, you, you feed them? Do you feed them? It's you know, cheap what? stylish. So it went from an alfalfa hay to a grass, a second day working grass. And it hit us a week later. So, so, so typically, classically, if you read the book, they'll say that the steers found when the pH is too high inside. But I, I, don't, I don't know. Let's put it this way. A lot of the sheep and goats that I see with listeriosis have never had solids in their bodies. They're right. Yes. And most of them are just, you know, pasture and hay, maybe a little grain, and I see it all the time. So, it's got to be something else, right? I'm still trying so, to Yeah, but that, that's where, that's where, is that still the thinking Rick? silage? Yeah, yeah, I don't know, uh, I mean, unless there were, I mean, a lot of the big causes are birds, uh, you know, droppings. Contamination. So if you have birds that are roosting where you're feeding the TMR on, on, on sheep, that doesn't take much. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have to put a slightly low moisture. What you said? You wouldn't have fallen slightly low when you pulled it? No, it's up. You would think if it went through, well, but as it ferments. If you fed ferments, as you said? No, as it, as it ferments, the pH should change. Yes. And so if you have a slightly low moisture, your fermentation is not going to be a pH point for our heat. Right. 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 And then, classically, that's what folks say, the pH is too high. Right. So, you mean you bring the gut back in order? The bicarb only takes 72 hours to work. You eat bicarb. Probably the already in the solid, though, right? Yeah, if it's in the solid. It's in the solid, the bicarb's bicarb not even doing that. I don't think. But I, honestly, I see a lot of times, it seems like they go in spurts. Oh, like, yeah. like, you know, if you just have a bunch, you may not have another one for a year or two. I don't, that's why I'm saying. You would think perhaps we change the problem. Yes. It was, uh, it was made on the fault of the tree. I just, I just, any time you go through a feed change, you are the pH. Stressed. We are the pH of the gut. Right. That might have been enough to do it. I've just seen so many cattle sides that have gotten it. Right. It's right. just hard for me. It's always, it's, you know, schools would talk about a little pH solid or high pH solid, but I've, I've just seen it so many times where. Right. Well, you don't find many cheap people feeding corn something. No. I met my first one. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what about the
bands on hot rations, and I see it on pet picnic goes. Uh, those are kind of the two most common ones I see, but you know, steers can get them. Just about any type of male can get them. And it's, you know, stones blocking the urinary tract. Um, does anyone have any experience with these? There. You gotta catch them early before you get them over. Well, yeah, the first time we didn't recognize the symptoms, uh -huh. it looked like that. It hadn't had ruptured so, yet, right. A lot of times they show that, signs of pain first. Yeah, he chose just one night, didn't come with the herd. Right. We could see what it is. He was dropping there, sitting, and he wasn't going to And that's what it was. And by the time we saw him, we went to the bed. The calcium was so high, they couldn't even operate right away. Right. So they had to sterilize him first and then not do it. He came back three, four months later. We got stones again four months yes, later. Yes, and then two months later it came, so we said, that's it. That's it. Well, there is two kinds, and there is one that you can treat. Can one that's easier to dissolve. To, to dissolve, and you can give some. Ammonium chloride. Yes, ammonium and chloride. one that there is no way. Right, it does not dissolve. And they told us grains, and no, 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 no. Which we didn't know. We were giving them grain. But in this particular case, we were giving the grain, the first time that this happened, they said, no grain, no alpha. We went up there and talked about the grain, but they still passed. So it was his nation. Right, just him, the way he tapped. Yeah, it was like over these 10 nails, 9 nails, 8 nails, and one of them, okay. like, so it was, he was more susceptible. So it's definitely out there, definitely happened. Early on, the most common thing I see, they almost they just seem like they kind of, their stance kind of have a wider stance, and their tails usually almost always up. And um, they strain. They, they strain, yes. They separate strain, they grit, they grit their teeth, just show signs of pain. Um, the earlier you get it, um, so, sometimes they're not complete, if you catch them early enough, they're not completely blocked, you can actually use them, ammonium chloride to get them to dissolve. Depends what kind of stone. Um, depends on what kind of stone, that's correct. So, here's a young lamb here, looks kind of rough. We got a different kind of parasite over here. Any ideas what this may be? Co coccidiosis. Okay, M major difference between, uh, that is that coccidia is a parasite just like homogus, but it's not a worm, it's a single, single cell parasite. Um, they, you know, affects the intestines and Another difference from homogus is that it usually does cause diarrhea. It makes them look, look unthrifty. And it affects mostly young stock. Generally, adults don't get too, too affected by coccidiosis. But it's definitely, definitely common. If I have, I have a young lamb or kid that has diarrhea, it's, it's top of my list. And it is treatable and preventable. about most of those things. The most common thing to treat with is corid, um, which is a trench you can get places. Um, and a lot of beads can have coccidia stats in them. It's <coughs> uh, a sheep. That's its neck. shows lambs, but there's something called club lamb fungus out there, um, and it seems like it can, it can be hog strands of that's hard, hard to get rid of, and I think it has to do with you shear them closely and shear them often, and you don't just affect, affect your blades in between lambs. Um, so if I see one like this, and someone wants to be very healthy to do a fair show, I can't, I can't let them go. Club lamb fungus. Anybody know what that is? Sore mouth. What do you, what do you guys do about it? Let it go. That's right. Some people spray WD-40. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's a virus. It's a virus. A lot of times it runs the course, people let it go, and it just go away. And actually, you can get it. It's so it's doing not. It's, it's a pox virus, yep. Pox. Yes. And humans humans can get it. So if your flock has it a lot, you probably should wear gloves when you're working on it. Absolutely. And uh <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's the first place we see them um, right off. You can see them on the foot. You can also see them, the baby lambs get it, they'll spread into the mother's teeth and udders. And that's kind of starts a cycle. Um, so it's called sore mouth, or a technical term for it's a virus, and it's definitely highly contagious. I don't know if it really affects the negatively that much, but it definitely looks bad. And you can't send your animals to shows or sales like that. Do you run into many blocks giving them sore mouth, like in the armpit? Like the vaccine? Yeah, just smoking them, just so they have the virus. Yeah, I mean, I, I heard about people doing that in school. I haven't actually had anybody do it. But the way they get the vaccine is kind of like you're saying. They actually, you know, scrape the skin and put put it there. That's how they got to get it. It's not just an injection. Yeah, that's what we would just... Pretty much what you do. Yeah, scratch the yeah. armpit and give them a drop and Here's another thing that I see sometimes in show lambs. So. Anybody know what that is? Prolapse. Yeah, it's a rectal prolapse. And I like to tell sheep producers that they kind of cause this themselves. Anybody know why? I tell sheep producers that they cause this due to, due to one of their management practices. They talk the tail too short. I show people like that. But uh, it seems like the ones that have the longer tails don't prolapse as much. All right. Mm -hmm. These are a couple here that are you know, getting ready for kids soon. One's large, and one can't get up. Yeah, that's right, pregnancy toxemia. Everybody know what that is? Pregnancy toxemia. Ketosis, you know, if you're a dairy cow, you call it ketosis. Basically, that's a lack of what? Energy. Yeah, no, not cows. Energy. Lack of energy. And most commonly, uh, these females, and you can see the sheep working oats, most of the time they're carrying multiple fetuses, you know, these twin triplets. And they're just literally sucking all the energy out of them. They eventually get weak and go down. Um, and, uh, Another thing, like I said, about sometimes it's hard to tell their body condition if they have a heavy hair, hair coat of wool. It's hard to tell if they're losing that much weight. And the best way to prevent it is to try to keep, you know, try to feed them right before, you know, a month or two leading up to them getting a landing. Um, if they get deficient in energy, get behind the ball and pull all their fat off their body to support the pregnancy, and th themselves are going to be too weak. They're going to get sick and not be able to get up. You ever treat a pregnancy toxic? No. No results. <laughs> what, do you, what do you use? Propylene glycol. Just like you would treat a dairy cow with blood test. Sort of Usually doesn't work. You say you don't have much success. It's tough. It's, one of the, it's just like the. Nothing. Nothing. Just like the big goat that's very pale. Once they get to that point, it's tough to turn around. Some people, if they're close enough to turn, they'll induce them to have labor or do a C-section to get the, get the pieces out there so they don't have so much of an energy drain.
then the second one just like flopped out. Generally, it happens before before they land with the kid. Uh, it could be, you know, it could be a month, it could be a week, it could be a day. And there's all different ways to try to keep it in, but it, it can be a challenge. What's the cause? Bad for prolapse. <laughs> and it's hard to say. What do you think of that? Why do you think that? They don't know. That's what they do. After they do it, you sell them, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Probably something to do with a combination. Some are just more likely to do it than others. It seems like once they start doing it, it's, it's going to be bad. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the individual selenium. Ah, I don't think so. You say selenium? Selenium, you know, selenium deficiency, deficiency is going to cause more skeletal muscle, whereas that doesn't really have that type of muscle. Both feet. Both feet. Too much stress. Yeah, pressure, yeah. Mm -hmm. you land More like that. Yeah. All right, that's all I got. Any questions or anything else? Anything mm -hmm. What about no fever? What does that look like? No fever. Uh, so no fever is low in what? Low in calcium. That happens pretty, usually pretty close to when they're going to get birth. Either right before or right after. Basically, it uh, affects the muscles. You generally can't get up there. Generally, now, it's kind of cool. Um, and uh, I don't want to say it's a paralysis. I didn't mean, actually say high at first. <laughs> it's one of the coolest things you give in calcium, and it almost. How do you tell the difference between that and ketosis? Do they look similar? Uh, ketosis is more slow or onset yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, they're like thin, whereas the calcium milk fever, you can look in good shape. And it's just going to be like, if one day she's running out fine, the next one is not, she can't get up. Whereas pregnancy toxemia, you know, generally they look like they're starting to go downhill before they can't get up. Why would milk why fever happen to a lot of well, that's it. Don't answer that yet. I got, we got a question while we're switching briefing patients. How many people have goats? No, you can answer it. I just, I got to order my presentation. How many have sheep? I mean, we're going to cover both, but I'm just trying to figure out how I'm going to look through it. As I told Josh when we started, I said there might be 10 or 15 people here. I don't know how much they'll know, and you'll probably go 20 minutes. I was wrong, and you people, as you're complimenting, you know a lot. So I'm going to try and skip through some of it. So go ahead, now you can answer. What were we talking about? <laughs> that wasn't my fault. I know you would have no fever. Oh, okay, so it happens you know, right, right before she calves, when you know, her udder's going to fill up, she gets all that drain right there. Okay. The calcium in the belt is kind of, that's why it happens. Where the ketosis thing is more of a steady drain of energy. Loss of body condition slowly go downhill, whereas milk fever is all of a sudden they're bagging up, they're getting ready to feed their, feed their offspring. Right. And they go, and they go, I don't know if I've never seen the goats. I don't know if I've seen the shoes. I don't know if they don't set the feet it's not from the house. It's not from the cows. It's from the passage. Yeah. It ties up other men. We're gonna we're gonna have to keep moving for the sake of uh, the time frame here because we're gonna have to get these guys on the road soon. But a couple of things while he's setting up his presentation, I wanted to cover real quick. Um, for those of you who maybe are not familiar with Snyder's Elevator, we've been in business since 1929, and we do appreciate your business. So if there's anything else that we can do for you, please let us know. Um, quickly, Shanda, can you stand up and raise your hand? Uh, Shanda is a member of our staff at Snyder's. Um, she has recently, this year, taken on a sales position. So if any of you um, would like some conversation, some nutritional advice, that type of thing. We do work with Rick, who is nutritionist, and then Shanda's on the road for us as well. Um, so 
they are available as well as Chad. And Chad, can you stand up? Um, Chad also is with ADM. So between Chad and Shanda, they have a lot of experience with goats and sheep. Um, so that, again, is a great resource for you because from the nutritional standpoint, the health and management standpoint, um, that they, you know, they can talk your talk and they're familiar with those animals. So I wanted to make sure I pointed that out. And we are proud that Shanda did very well at Farm Show this year, by the way, with her market lamp. Um, so, you know, just a little aside note about that. Um, we do um, have, it seems increasingly, in the world that we live in, less and less people involved in farming and agriculture. So it is a pleasure to deal with all of you and your connections that you have with farming and agriculture. Um, we try to do what we can at Snyder's to support the groups that are involved with that. Um, so here just recently, the FFA is going to have a special event coming up, and we made a donation to them for their auction that they're doing. That would be the Konica G FFA. Um, we also do our best to support 4-H events. Um, and then also, um, more recently, we got involved in something that's a little bit different. Um, the St. Thomas Elementary School has been um, taking up donations for the kids. They go home and don't have enough food to eat at night and on the weekends. So we've also been accepting donations, um, and there's some flyers about that St. Thomas Elementary School program that we're supporting as well. Um, we do do tours of our mill, also as an effort to support agriculture and as an educational type of thing. Um, and I wanted to mention that some people don't realize we do custom mixes. So um, with the 500 pound minimum and with the help of a nutritionist like Chad or Rick, that they can come up with a formula for you and we can do a custom mix if that's something that you require or you're interested in. I know some of you in the room already do custom mixes, so you're well aware of that, but I know there are some folks that don't realize that's a service that we offer in addition to our Snyder's brand feeds that we have. So we do have a variety of our own Snyder's feeds, but there are products from ADM that are complete feeds that we can get as well. Sweet Unique is on promotion. They offer free feed for both lambs as well as kids, and um, that's a promo that's available now for the end of April. Uh, buy two, get one free deal, so that's a really good deal. Um, and as Rick has generously offered to add to our no prizes for the evening, um, we do have two Snyder's gift cards to give out from Snyder's, but then we also have the ADM, uh, your choice of goat or sheep block, if you win one. It's a 33 pound block, um, so if anybody, um, your name gets pulled for that, you can come into the office and, and just pick that up at your convenience. Um, and a couple of things, um, just to make you aware, in addition to the fact that we do carry some blocks and tubs that are mineral products, um, we also have, if anybody approaches any of the natural side of things and you're interested in diatomaceous earth, uh, we do have that in 40 pound bags, and the product we have is human grade diatomaceous earth, which some people, you know, I'm sure it may be a controversial warmer product, but it works by mechanical action, not a chemical product. Um, so that's available. We do have some different fencing type products available if you're going to be doing some rotational grazing and that type of thing. And the vaccine that he mentioned, Dr. Skipton, um, the CDT, we do have CDT in the fridge um, there at the store. And um, he talked about nutrition, and Rick's going to talk about nutrition, but I noticed when Dr. Skipton mentioned balance and nutrition, you know, that's just something to be aware of. And so when you work with somebody, like Rick or Chad, they can help you balance what your feeding program is so you're getting the right balance depending on the forages that you're feeding at home on the farm. Um, the free fecal testing, like I mentioned, that's an option. That's a good thing you can take advantage of if you want to. The details are on the flyer that we have on the table. And we do have a Facebook and a website for the store, so for any of you that follow that type of thing, that is another way that we promote some of our sales and specials. Um, and also any event that we do like this, we put on there. But um, we do have sale flyers that we're handing out at the counter. And if you would like to be on an email or a mailing list for the sale flyer, let us know and we'll get you on that as well so that you know when the sales are coming up. Third Friday and Saturday of each month is store wide sale, but then we also do additional events. Mm -hmm. So,
right, Doug Elliott? And you get one as well. And one more for the sheep and, your choice of sheep or goat blog is Kirk Cunningham. So Kirk Cunningham, you're up next for that. And then we'll have a Snyder gift card.
the easiest way to know the protein level of your hay is to sample it, okay? If you, if you, especially if you have a supply that's pretty constant, but you're not buying some in all the time. There is a laboratory in Zollinger uh, between Waynesboro and Greencastle. And it is considered the, one of the best hay labs in the world. Okay, so if you want to get a hay sample taken, all you got to do is borrow a board. Uh, a board meaning uh, not a board goat, you know, a board that you would, <laughs> would drill into a bale with. And you would get that, you can get it from us. Uh, extension people have it. You drill about a half a dozen bales and you take it down to the Cumberland Valley Labs. It's on. There's a business park now. Uh, Bay Miller Drive, yeah, it's back in there. They have a little drop-off box, like a whole milk can where you used to do it milk in You just throw it in there. And you ask for NIR2, okay? NIR2 wet chemistry. And what that wet chemistry means is that's how they do the minerals, the wet chemistry. But basically what you would do then is you would figure out how much hay they're eating, calculate the protein from that, deduct that from 0.36, and that is how much you put in your feed. And the thing that's neat about Snyder's, if they're making the feed, they can change it to anything. People come up to me and say, I, I cannot feed an 18% to my meat goat. Okay, I can only feed a 16%. Well, if you feed an 18% at 0.3 pounds a day and a 16% at 0.4 pounds a day, guess what? They get the same amount of protein. So, uh, but it's just, uh, what we do what, people like because there's an old saying in sales, the customer is always right, okay? So, now, energy. We measure energy a couple of ways. TDN is the old method. Uh, we also use any gain. Uh, we do this both. I use any gain in sheep diets. Uh, any, the difference between TDN and any gain measures the, uh, this is always great to talk about the it measures Never mind. It just measures <laughs> a different form of energy that has to do with the PCs. Um, so, again, same thing, the NRC that I was talking about. If you're dealing in meat goats uh, and, and, and they may be carrying twins, you need 3.44 pounds of TDN a day. If you get that hay sample done at, at Cumberland Valley, they will give you a TDN level. Again, you calculate how much they eat, you subtract it. And then you go into the Snyder's and say, I need a feed that has this level of any gain in it. Uh, ingredients that have high levels of any gain are corn. That's the number one, number one thing. Corn is also very high in starch, okay, which can cause uh, uh, sore feet issues in animals. But starch, it, it, we call it candy bar energy. When you take corn and grind it up and you put it into a, a ruminant, it's available right away. So um, if you want to slow it down, you add some barley. If you want to slow it down a little further, you add some oats. Okay? You want to really slow it down, uh, you add soy balls or alfalfa meal, but then the goats won't like you. Um, mineral requirements, uh, that's pretty standard. Most all companies are always going to follow the NRC and cover the, and cover the minimums. Um, one thing I want to mention about urinary calculi, <coughs> people say I need a 2 to 1 ratio in my brain level to, to prevent it. It's not true. It's a 2 to 1 level in the total for it, total ratio. So, again, when you go to the lab and you get that NR2, they'll give you a calcium and a phosphorus. So you can just sat, sit down. And Shannon can help you, I can help you, we, we can show you how you come up with a calcium phosphorus ratio. Uh, one thing I might mention, there are two hays that really run the calcium level up in goats and sheep. One is alfalfa and one is clover. Uh, I would always stay away from clover hay if you're feeding a lot of males, whether it be sheep or goats. If anybody has any questions about what's going on, you can, you can certainly go, but I'm going to be pretty safe time because I'm going to be relatively fast because you're a sharp group. Um, and words and pygmies uh, do not tolerate copper. Um, is there copper in sheep feed? Yes, there is. There's, copper is naturally occurring and uh, it can be tied up with a product called another mineral called molybdenum. 
so don't ask me to spell that. But um, there is naturally occurring copper in everything. So you can't, you know, we just don't add copper, and we don't add it in those two types of boats. Um, Dr. Skipton talked about high sulfur content, uh, which is uh, rocking ferns is one of the things, or if you get in to feeding corn that's wet, I mean, you don't get into wet the corn distiller, but anything, some corn byproducts that have higher sulfur levels, and, uh, and we all add thyme into it, and, and also we add, uh, you know, plenty of bean vitamins. All right, I want to talk about the last month of gestation. Uh, sometimes we get into issue, this also occurs for sheep. One of the reasons why we get into ketosis issues sometimes is they, they can't eat enough feed. Uh, because if they're carrying twins, you have that rumen, and all of a sudden it's being pushed to the side, pushed to the side, and we can't get enough into them. So we try and um, increase, you know, people say, I don't want to feed a goat or pellet. I don't know what's in it. Uh, it is a denser feed, so you can sometimes get a little more, a little more out of it. But uh, one of the things I'll tell some people to top dress with sometimes is roasted beans, because it has a little bit of a... Uh, had a lot more roasted beans or 20% of that. Okay, those of you that are uh, dairying um, on, on dairy goats, uh, this is just some of the some milk data on how much they produce and, and just how much we look at uh, we we'll look at butter fat and protein too, what we call fat corrected milk. When doing diets, uh, again, you get into the same TDN issues, uh, and, and if you look, the alpines are usually one of the uh, major ones that's producing milk. Again, it depends on the uh, breed. Okay, this gets into uh, making feeds, and um, um, we Susan takes what's called the 36% goat concentrate. And like I said, blend it with all kind of ingredients, um, usually barley, corn, oats, and some kind of uh, some kind of mixture. But we also have minerals. When they go out on pasture, they really do not need a lot of grain. And if there was a grain, I would feed. It might be just a, a tick of corn uh, because the protein content is so high in pasture, they can't handle it as well, and corn, that starch, helps make that protein more available. So does anyone have any, um, there's some information back there on goat tubs. Susan mentioned the goat blocks. It's all about using with goats and also with sheep, using as much forage as you can to cut your feed usage down. Now the only way you know how good your forages are is to actually have a sample. Everybody's hay is the best. Uh, sometimes, but we are dealing with a very, very poor A coming from 2018. Whenever you get a lot of rain, it washes the sugar content out of the hay, and, and you basically have hay that's not very digestible. And that's created a lot of issues. I'm not, I think it's created a problem with parasites this year because the plant of nutrition is down due to the quality of the hay. Uh, I don't know if you know it, but there's a test we call relative feed value. That's how you test the quality. And then chat need your systems to go to the sheep. Does anybody have any questions on feeding goats? All right, if not, we're going to shift, shift to sheep. And, um, and we're going to shift. Yeah, I was going to say, I almost said a bad word. Uh, <laughs>
So, and Shanda's available to talk to you as well. So, just keep in mind that's the service that we offer. Hey, and, and uh, Chief, uh, we get concerned about the protein content, and I'll get into the numbers uh, in a minute, during late gestation and during lactation. Can there be, is there enough protein in forage to uh, meet a sheep's uh, uh, use requirement on protein in the early part of the gestation? Other than the hay that was in 2018, my answer would be yes. We've, we've had protein levels in hay this year as low well as 6 or 7 percent. And I thought that was only in Montana, but it's, it's here. Um, hopefully that will change, but who knows? Uh, knows. Um, protein usually is expressed as a percent, but we don't do that with diets. We're looking usually at grams of protein intake or fractions of a pound. I don't know what, if you, what your uh, idea of urea is, Sheep are very good at handling urea. You just have to really watch how much you put it. So usually we limit it to no more than 1% of the total diet. That operation down in uh, Bellsville that I was telling you about, we fed a fair amount of urea in that diet. And I know she did very, very well. Okay, again, same thing as we were talking about with the, with the uh, goats. If you're talking about a ewe and late gestation, carrying twins, um, we need to get a uh, fruit protein level in them of about a half pound a day. Same thing, get the hay tested, calculate intakes. Sheep eat a little less than uh, goats. They're usually around three to three and a quarter percent of their body weight. But if you look in the first six to eight weeks of lactation, over on the far side, we need almost a 15% protein. That's everywhere. So if your hay is 12% protein, you need an overall 15%, you've got to have your grain mix up around 18 in order to get the necessary protein requirements. Uh, lambs, uh, usually uh, most are in an 18 to a 22% range. Again, uh, the difference between an 18 and a 20% on intake, if they eat just an ounce or two more, it will be roughly close to the same amount of protein. Um, The reason why we see ketosis uh, a lot in, in sheep is energy is their most common limiting nutrient because of the size of their rumen. Again, the same thing as a goat. They are limited also by the size of how many they're carrying. If they're carrying twins, that's where we see the most ketosis. There is a, uh, an ionophore. Do you know what an ionophore is? Um, Boba tech. Uh, we're not allowed to feed rumensin in sheep. Well, we can in goats, which is weird. Uh, but they're in the same category. They prevent ketosis, okay? So if I was having a lot of ketosis, and I could somehow feed boba tech in late, very, very late gestation, very, very early lactation, I would probably give that a try because it works very, very well to cure, uh, to cure, uh, to help prevent ketosis. Um, Carbohydrates is how we get our energy. Again, one of the highest forms of carbohydrate we can get is corn. Okay, here's something people don't realize. that 70% of the fetal growth occurs in the last four weeks in a ewe. And their, their protein and energy requirements increase by 50 to 75%. That's a lot. Uh, Again, talk about the limited amount of space that could be there. So Tom, sometimes we've got to have our, our lamb or our UV up around 16 to 18% protein. Now, someone mentioned feeding alfalfa hay. Most of the alfalfa hay we test can run 20% protein, and that helps a lot, except for that mineral potassium. Now, here's the funny thing. After the kid, potassium becomes the most limiting nutrient. Prior to kidding, it causes milk fever. So it's a very, very, very fine line. Yes? I understand that most people that grow alfalfa usually top dress it after they do all the versions. Top dress it with urea? Top dress it with oats. Okay. Which would make the first cutting much 
much lower in phosphorus. Correct. Okay. They're usually, and however, I will say something. The mineral that changes, there was a gentleman that was feeding corn silage to the sheep. Uh, if we were to sample corn silage, alfalfa hay, and orchard grass hay, and I show you the phosphorus level of the three, you wouldn't be able to tell which product I was. If I hid the name, meaning that forages tend to run very constant in phosphorus, no matter what it is. It's the calcium that flows, okay, drastically. In other words, an alfalfa hay, when we look at cow phosphorus ratios, alfalfa hay has a 4 to 1 ratio. Uh, orchard, or uh, clover hay has a 6 to 1 ratio. Orchard grass has about a 2 and a half to 1 ratio. But the thing that stays constant is the phosphorus level. Yeah, but first cutting tends to be, if there's one that's different, it's the first cutting. Yeah, is it enough to make a huge difference? Not a lot, I'm gonna be honest with you, okay? And we watch phosphorus close in this area of the country because it makes crabs um, non-fertile, okay? So we're regulated, we are regulated by the amount of phosphorus we can put in a field. Uh, in the old days, we used to use it to get rid of breeding problems. Phosphorus is excellent for breeding problems and, and ruminants, but we can't recommend that anymore. Actually, it's getting down to the point where we can hardly recommend it. So, that's the point I'm saying. Ewes can lose a lot of uh, body conditioning, and the reason why I mentioned um, there's, there's other books back there that there's a body scoring system in there, uh, that you can go over and do it and try it. Um, it's on a scale of one to five. And you get the real good people that say, well, she's a three and a half. And you get the real good people say, no, 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 she's not three and a half. She's three and a quarter. Okay, so. But anyway, it's not the number per se as much as it is the relative change they go through. And that's what you have to notice. And they can lose, uh, you do not want them losing more than a half a point in late gestation. That is a setup for ketosis. They just can't make enough energy. Um, the other mineral uh, that's very important, uh, and we have it added in our feeds, is the mineral zinc. We tend to be pretty low out in this area on zinc. Um, again, I'm going to show you that. Uh, just make sure that the feeds that you're using have a good level of zinc in them. We're pre we've been making sheep feeds for over 100 years. So we, uh, we're, we feel as though we're fairly knowledgeable on what the mineral level should be. And you can alter it with minerals. Uh, if, if you so you don't have to add, people say, we got to add more of the concentrate that has that the protein, that has more vitamins and minerals. But yes, it does, but you can add just some minerals. In some case, you can add just a mineral. All right, uh, we use uh, what we call all-natural vitamin E in our feed. That comes from the soybeans uh, product. Soybeans contain, uh, the outer shell contain a very available form of vitamin E, and we use that in a lot of our feeds. And uh, it's, it's a, we call it kind of an or, not an organic source, it's a more available source. So that you'll see a lot of times in, in all our feeds. But other vitamins levels are important too. Again, we talk about the, the from late gestation, the increase from early gestation. When you get into the first four to six weeks of lactation, it goes up to another 75%. So there's a huge, if, if you're needing a half pound of protein a day in that late gestation, you, you're needing up to worse three quarters of a pound to a pound in the, in the lactate units. So that is a fair amount of protein for them to handle at one time. That's why we use urea. Urea has five times the amount of protein of soybean in it. Okay, so we can squeeze a little bit of that in just because we're trying to get in more room. Uh, this is a hard one to recommend, but we always try and say separate. Uh, if, you're, if you have them nursing twins, try and separate them away. Nobody will. Well, I mean, I'll, I, have, I work with a lot of customers that have everything together, and it's hard to, it's hard to split. But it would be nice if you could. Okay, um, again, they need 0.66 pounds of protein a day. If you remember, I talked about the meat code at, at about 0.4 to 
0.45, and their body weight of consumption is not as high as a goat, but they're bigger. So we, we typically gauge them. That would be another good thing, too, that if you could weigh your animals, but that's probably getting a little too technical. I always figure 150 pounds. So if you use 3% of 150, that's 4.5 pounds of dry matter a day. All right? If their hay is 90% dry, uh, 1 10 percent water, so if you were feeding all hay, that would only be about uh, five and a half pounds of hay. But you know, we, we have to work the grain in there. Um, sometimes we'll recommend people, if their ewes are really, really thin, to top dress a little bit of extra corn, or again, down at the bottom, go with the higher protein hay, if you can help it. Or actually just top dress a little bit of, of roasted beans, because that gets energy and protein. I do want to caution you on know, one thing on uh, sheep aren't very tolerant to a uh, product called trypsin, uh, so don't feed them raw beans. It usually doesn't work uh, very well. Um, again, um, we can make a, you can make adjustments in the amount of grain you feed just by looking at the body conditioning of the animal. We, uh, we get into situations where, where the, the people say, can I not feed any grain? Um, if the forages are high enough in energy and it's in the early part of gestation or if it's a lamb that's not being raised for show, for show, you can do that. I have some lamb show people, they don't get as high as like three or four pounds of grain into their lambs per day, sometimes five. There's the body scoring uh, thing uh, from, a, at, at a, uh, from a breeding, when they're, we're breeding them, we want to be at a three, uh, early gestation about two and a half. Late gestation about three. That's uh, and it's in that sheep management book that we have back on the table. Um, I'm gonna talk talked enough about urinary calculi. Oh, I just want to say one thing about uh, zinc is uh, we use a very available form of zinc, uh, zinc refining and zinc oxide are two very good uh, products to use. Zinc also has a secondary uh, claim. If you ever get uh, a lot of sore feet and you're used, uh, especially the time of the year we're coming in, there's a product called Zinpro that's out there. If you kick that into the feed, especially if you're getting a brown feed, uh, that can do a really good job. Uh, uh, Skip, or Dr. Skipton talked about polyencephalomasia. Uh, uh, which again comes from eating uh, certain plants and high sulfur products, and and we we have thiamine in all the feeds. Most companies do, but it's a good idea sometimes to check your bag or, or find out what amount they're using. I want to skip and lastly talk about like products. Uh, Susan uses the 36% uh, sheep concentrate. You can see it does contain a little bit of urea in it, but we. She blends uh, the ingredients she has at her mill to make custom type feeds with about a 500 pound minimum amount. So you can match it up actually to meet your hay sample. Uh, if you're out on range, uh, we do make what we call weatherized minerals. Those are minerals that when they get rained on, uh, they're still the same. They're the same wet as they are dry. Uh, they, they, nothing leaches out of them. And uh, we carry a complex zinc, that's that Zimpro that I was talking about, in all our mineral products. We also make a sheep tub. Uh, we're one of the largest manufacturer of tubs in the country. Um, it is, I'll be honest with you, it, it is a, it's a convenient way to feed. It's not necessarily the least expensive, but our, our tub is a 21 protein. It's a press tub. Uh, and consumption on that runs anywhere from four ounces a day up to about 12. It's geared to be at about a six to seven ounce feeding rate. And most times it'll, it'll stay it's pretty close to that. All our feeds do contain ammonium chloride and they also contain added molybdenum to help with copper situations. We're very low in this area on hay. Um, we make a what's called a cold pelleted creep feed. Uh, if you're creeping lambs and, and you don't make your own, uh, it's a 21% protein. That's where most creep feeds are. Cold pelleted means the kind of the molasses is on the outside, 
So it's not a sweet feed. Uh, it doesn't attract flies. The consumption on it is very consistent and it's a very, very dense feed. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the sheep block. That's the thing that Susan gave away. It's a 22% protein. Um, it's got predominantly soybean meal in it, a little bit of fat. Again, there's one for sheep called red block, and there's one for goats also that she carries in her mill. We do, uh, I'll put one plug in. We make one of the best lamb show feeds around, but uh, uh, if you have any, know of any 4-H kids, they'll be happy with the 4-H feed that we feed. Now, we're turning the literature back. I, uh, gee, it, I, I do appreciate you coming out. I know some of you came a pretty long distance. And again, thanks to Doc. Let's give Dr. Skipton a round of applause. Longest trip back. So we'll and be here to answer any questions. Uh, for Dr. Few Skipton's with Mid Maryland Vets. Just for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Mid Maryland Vet is uh, is the practice that he's in, and he is the vet that sees probably the most sheep and goat out of the, out of their plane. Um, so you know, you need to contact him. You know, uh, we do stock the Zinpro product that he, he referenced, um, and then also if there's any of the other ADM products that you're interested in, please let us know. We, we have them. We'll show you if we need to get them in. We're happy to get them in. Um, we actually have four pending right now, or uh, if I still have time to add one. <laughs> but um, we, we order with them like every like sometimes every week, once every couple weeks from now. So it's usually no problem to get this product in. Um, and thanks to Rick for coming out as well, and Chad and Chad, because they took the time out of their evening to come and help out with the meeting. And uh, we do appreciate your business, so please let us know.